Christmas and the birth of Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. I don't know where those gifts are, and they don't, they're not continuing to give to me. I don't know what they're doing now, and I don't even know what, I don't have a clue. But I know Christmas, and I know Christ is the gift that keeps on giving. You want to stand with me while we read this morning? Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 11. Verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men of the east came to Jerusalem. They came saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where this Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Lord, we confess to you this morning as a congregation, today we are all guilty of losing sight of you, the very one who this holiday is exclusively about. Help us this morning to remember the gift of your birth. Let us not forget that your salvation is the gift that keeps on giving. You honor the reading of your word, the preaching of your word, the hearing of your word, and our obedience to your word. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Let me start today's sermon by giving you the main point. The birth of Jesus is a gift that changed the world. But has it changed you? It changed the world, but has it changed you? Now I'm sure that every one of you in this audience right this very minute think of someone that you would like to change. Probably have a family member, co-worker, friend, someone in your neighborhood that you would like to change, and you can mentally at this very moment think of exactly how to change them, exactly how to make them better, exactly how to make them exactly what you want them to be. But many times we forget about having our own lives changed by the power of the gift of Jesus. Oh, how easy it is to see the flaws in someone else and how hard it is to see them in our own life. As the birth of Jesus changed the whole world, but the question on the table is, has it changed you? Let me walk you quickly through the text with an outline. And then I want to share with you three things to try to drive home the point this morning of Jesus, the gift that keeps on giving. Look at the text. In verses 1 and 2, it shows us the people and the place of his birth. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, there's the place. Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So we see all of these places and these people of his birth. What do we see? Two things there, royalty and humility. We see the royalty of the kings coming, but little did they know of the royalty of the babe. But we also see the humility of the birth of Jesus in a stable, in a barn, in a manger. Verses 3 and 4 show us the problem of his birth, the jealousy and the authority that the king had. Look at verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and people together, he inquired of them where this Christ was to be born. So the problem with his birth is that the king had jealousy and didn't want any part of the authority of Jesus. His authority was threatened. And so therefore, there was a problem here. The problem was that the government didn't want their authority questioned. Verses 5 and 6 show us the prophecy of his birth, as you can read, as I just read to you, of the Old Testament's prophets prophesying of the birth of Jesus in 5 and 6. 
that was accomplished and now it's unavoidable. Verses 7 and 8 show us the planning or the plotting against his birth. The evil and manipulative king trying to, to, to destroy this new baby and trying to do it in a way that wouldn't make him look bad. So what did he do? He called for the wise men and said, hey, when you find this baby, bring him to me so I can worship him too. No, 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 that's not his plan at all. But then verses 9 and 10 show us the point of his birth. Verses 9 and 10. When they heard that the king had, the, when they heard the king when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen from the east came and stood over where this young child was. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. So the point of his birth was worship and joy. Oh, King Herod wanted to destroy him. Yes, King Herod wanted him dead. Yes, King Herod was manipulating the wise men to try to destroy this baby. But the wise men arrived on the scene and they, were, they had exceedingly great joy. They arrived and they worshiped this child which is the whole point of the birth of Jesus that you and I would enter into a new worship of a new king that King Herod isn't in control anymore and then verse 11 shows us the presence at his birth three very significant gifts that we'll look at in just a moment of gold frankincense and myrrh but the first thing I want you to see this morning is that the birth of Jesus is a birth that changed the whole world but has it changed you. Number one, the gift of Jesus affected much more than a lowly manger. In verse one, we see that the Magi from the east were affected. They come from likely Babylon, Arabia that we know of for sure. So we're looking at modern day Saudi Arabia. They've traveled potentially 900 miles potentially. We see that these Magi were affected. We see the heavens were affected as the star moved from the east to settle over where this Christ was. We see that the Roman king or the Roman clientele king of Judah of Judea, Herod was affected. We see that church leadership was affected as the chief priests and scribes were called in. We see the scriptures themselves being fulfilled as the Old Testament writers now are seeing their prophecies come to fruition. We see the minor prophets affected as well. We see Bethlehem, this small town, affected. We see that again the cosmos affected a second time in verse 9. The Magi leading to joy were affected. Mary and Joseph were affected. This birth of Jesus affected much more than just a mom and a dad in a lowly manger. The power of his birth affected Bethlehem. Herod, the king, the Roman Empire had implications. Wise men from the east, Jerusalem, all this just in verse 1. The power of his birth stretched so much farther beyond this lowly manger. If you continue reading the rest of the chapter, guess what you find out? You find out that all the, all the babies under two are going to be slaughtered. It affected other people's families. If you continue reading this chapter, you'll find out that they flee to Egypt. Another country is going to be affected. If you keep reading this chapter, you'll find out that they'll end up in Nazareth too, where another small town will be affected. The birth of Jesus doesn't simply have implications that stop on December 25th, but it stretches much further than that. Let me illustrate it for you. I was born in Gaffney, South Carolina at Cherokee Memorial Hospital on 11 one at 11.07 p.m. That was my birthday. Bruce and Brenda Mahaffey were impacted. I had a little sister at, uh, sister at the time who was two years old. She didn't even know what was going on. Tolly and Bernice Mahaffey, my grandparents on dad's side, and Frank and Hilda Robbins, my grandparents on my mom's side, had a new grandson in their lives. That's as far as it goes. That's as far as it stretches. Yeah, I had an aunt on one side and a cousin on the other, but that's as far as it stretches. None of y'all were affected. Oh, you're affected now, though, aren't you? None of y'all were affected. Y'all didn't even know. Nobody in this room was kicking up a fuss on December, on November the 1st, 1977, for a baby born in Gaffney, South Carolina, in a little square hospital room. Nobody kicked up a fuss. It didn't even stretch beyond the walls of that room, uh, except... It, to my grandparents who weren't even there. It didn't stretch very far. But the birth of Jesus stretches so far that here we are 2,000 years later in Northbrook still impacting people's lives. It's the gift that keeps on giving. The birth of Jesus affected much more than a lowly manger. It had government impact, the kings. It had church leadership impact, the scribes. It had major city impact, Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Small town impact, Nazareth, Bethlehem, or Nazareth and Bethlehem. Large towns like Jerusalem and Babylon. Other countries affected like Egypt. It had national conspiracy. They're having people killed 
by the government to cover up, to try to get rid of this Jesus. In far-stretching implications, so much so that it's getting to the point of becoming a global impacted birth. My birth didn't affect the globe. It barely got outside those walls. Did your birth affect the globe? Probably much like mine. Had a couple people impacted. But guess what? The birth of Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. How does a baby born in the middle of nowhere affect so much? How does a baby born to an unwed teenage mom affect so much? How does a baby born in such a lowly place and such humble means to such innocent people carry so much weight? Let me answer that for you. Because the birth of Jesus isn't any other birth. The birth of Jesus is a supernatural birth with the power of heaven behind it, in it, and with it. Let me say that again. The power of heaven behind it, in it, and with it. The birth was a gift that would keep on giving. Mary would give birth to a baby that would give her eternal life. Joseph raised a baby that would one day raise him. Mary experienced the pain of labor for Jesus, and Jesus experienced the pain of the cross for her. Joseph was a carpenter, and the very nails he would drive would be the very thing that would kill his son. Mary gave birth to a son, and no one even saw it. And yet this same son will one day split the eastern sky, and the Bible tells us every eye will see it. Jesus was born not as any other birth, but as the gift that would keep on giving eternal life to all and to any who would believe. The birth of Jesus changed the world, but the question on the table is, has it changed you? The gift of Jesus affected much more than a lowly manger. Number two, the gift of Jesus is not insignificant. Oh, a manger is insignificant, not a big deal. Bethlehem was even insignificant. Nazareth, very insignificant, so much so that it's not even a dot on the map. It's not, it doesn't even appear on the maps. A baby born in the middle of the backwoods shack at an old inn, not seemingly the place fit for a king, seems very insignificant. The overall absence of anything resembling earthly royalty at this baby's birth may make it appear as if it's insignificant, but it's not. Make no mistake, this baby Jesus, although gifted to us in humble means, will one day come again for us in complete authority. This baby Jesus, gifted to us in humble means, will one day come again in undeniable power. This baby Jesus, gifted to us, will one day come again as the sky splits and every eye watches him ascend in his authority and his power. When he came on the scene the first time as a baby in a manger with no one there and not much fanfare, make no mistake, the next time there will be no denying who the king is. Just because it happened a long time ago don't mean it's insignificant. Just because it happened in a faraway country doesn't mean it's insignificant. Just because it happened long before the TV, long before a phone, a cell phone, or long before the internet doesn't mean that it's insignificant. Actually, the birth of Jesus is extremely significant, so significant that here we are today still being impacted by it. The gift and the birth of Jesus is so significant that even Northbrook has been impacted. Literally, the gift of Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. The gift of Jesus affected much more than a lowly manger. Number two, the gift of Jesus is not insignificant. Number three and last, the gift of Jesus is found in the gifts to Jesus. Watch this, church. The gift of Jesus is found in the gifts to Jesus. What do you mean? Well, when the Magi came on the scene, they brought very specific gifts to Jesus. What were the gifts they gave him? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? They didn't bring your typical dad gifts, cologne, socks, and a tie. They didn't bring today's modern-day gifts, a PlayStation 5, an Xbox, or a cell phone. They didn't bring the typical holiday snacks of candy canes, fruit cakes, and eggnog. They didn't bring stocking stuffers, gift cards, or Reese cups. They should have. But they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I've heard this my whole life just like you have. And I, if I was in your position, sitting there, which I was for many years, I'd ask myself, why? Why those gifts? Why does the Bible make such a fuss about these three gifts? Why of everything that could have been brought to this baby Jesus, why gold, frankincense, and myrrh? As a matter of fact, most of us in our culture don't even know what frankincense and myrrh are. I mean, it almost sounds like a bad TV show. <laughs> like y'all ever watch Frankincense and Myrrh? 
No. What in the world are these things? Watch, church. Why gold? Royalty. Why frankincense? Divinity. Why myrrh? Humanity. Why gold? Because it shows Jesus our king. Why frankincense? Because it will show Jesus our worship. And why myrrh? Because it will show Jesus our sacrifice. Let me show you. Gold would represent Jesus as our king. A gift given to a king would be a sign of royalty. You would take him gold. Even though he wouldn't necessarily need it because he'd probably already have it, it would show that you recognize his royalty. Why would wise men from the east, the wealthiest place, come to this no-name no place and bring gold to a baby that can't even do anything with it? Why? Because they recognize Jesus as their new king. In 1 Kings chapter 10, Queen Sheba comes to visit Solomon, and guess what she brings? Gold. In 1 Kings 6, the Bible tells us that the Holy of Holies inside the temple where the presence of God resides is layered with gold. In 1 Peter, Peter says that our faith is more precious than gold. Acts chapter 3, Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but in the name of Jesus I tell this lame man to get up and walk. Why would they use gold? I mean, gold, as you can see here, is, so, is, is of utmost importance. It's the symbol of royalty. In Revelation 21, the Bible tells us when that new city comes down, when it's all said and done and God has remade it all, that that city will be a city in streets of pure gold. Globally, there's a thing called the gold standard, in which a standard economic unit is based on a fixed quantity of gold. Gold is so precious that the world's money is compared to it in any country that you go to. In the Olympics, the world's greatest athletes are awarded with what? The gold medal. They don't give the greatest ones the silver medal or the bronze medal. They give them the gold medal. Gold is usually owned by the wealthiest. It's usually owned by those in authority. It's usually owned by only those who can afford it. Gold is recognized and is arguably the most precious metal you could own. Gold shows royalty in which this baby would have. He would not just be baby Jesus, but he's King Jesus. Why would they bring gold to a baby? Because they already recognize he's not a baby, he's their king. Frankincense, why in the world bring this candle burning incense? Why? This is the very fragrance that was burned inside the temple before Jesus came on the scene in a place inside the temple that's called the Holy of Holies. So if you enter into the temple from the outer courts into the temple, there's a, little, there's a room on the inside of the temple where the presence of God is, is held. And inside that room, only the, chief, only the chief priest could enter, or the high priest could enter in. And when he would enter in, he would burn frankincense as a worship to the presence of God. So frankincense wasn't just any other cologne, fragrance, or candle to bring. It wasn't that he went to Bath and Body Works and just brought the next candle in. It wasn't a, a Yankee candle. No, he brought frankincense. Why? Because this is the symbol of worship to the Jewish people. Once a year when he would enter in to this place to worship inside the Holy of Holies, he would bring this fragrance, burn it, and give it to God. The aroma would be sweet. They could smell it. You could smell it from far, from far away. And this frankincense was a symbol of worship to every Jew would know that if you bring frankincense, you're bringing it to worship. Watch, church, we've brought gold to have a baby that can't even do anything with it. Why? Because they already recognize he's not a baby, he's their king. They bring frankincense, why? He's too young to play with fire, he can't burn it, right? But they bring it, why? Because they're bringing it to symbolize worship. And third, they bring myrrh. This shows Jesus our sacrifice. Myrrh was used to anoint dead bodies. It was an embalming fluid. It has aloe in it as well, and they would use it to embalm in ancient Israel. Why bring a newborn something suited for a dead man? Why bring something to a fresh body that's reserved for a dead body? I understand gold, you can spend it. I understand frankincense, you can burn it. But why bring an embalming gift to a baby? It almost seems like an insult. Hey, baby, we know you got a lot of life ahead of you. Here's what you're going to need when you die. Think about it, though, church. Why bring gold? They recognize him as their king. Why bring frankincense? They come to worship. Why bring myrrh? Because they already know that he's going to be their sacrifice. That he's going to, to be the king that dies for them. 
In John chapter 19, verse 38, after Jesus is crucified and after he is placed in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, the Bible tells us that Nicodemus and Joseph come to the tomb to anoint the body and they bring with them a hundred pounds of myrrh. Think about it, church. The last gift given to Jesus was the same as the first gift given to Jesus and they both recognized that he was going to need it. Why? Because he was going to die for the sins of the people. Gold, Jesus as our king. Frankincense, Jesus as our God that we worship. Myrrh, Jesus as our sacrifice that would one day die for you and I. The gift of myrrh would be a powerful indicator of the life and death that our Jesus would live and die on our behalf. Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. And Jesus is the gift that changed the world. The question is, has it changed you? In conclusion, if Jesus is the gift that changes the world, the question isn't, has he changed others? The question is, has he changed you? If this baby Jesus was given to us to make us see the light of the world or make us see a new light in this dark world, then the question is, have you seen that light? If this baby Jesus that was given to us is the gift that keeps on giving, then has that salvation been given to cover your sins, past, present, and future? Jesus Christ, the gift, the baby Jesus, the gift that keeps on giving, it changed the world. Has it changed you? Father, thank you for Mount Vernon Baptist Church. God, this morning, as we all go our separate ways, I pray that you help us to remember that your birth did change the world, but we got to ask ourselves, has it changed us? Lord, I pray that we don't look at this just as a holiday, and get lost in the nostalgia of all the giving and gifts. Lord, I pray that we, we, we remember the gift that keeps on giving, Jesus, our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.